That's true. I think of skinny ties, I think of uh, Bill Gannon on Dragnet. Got that black tie about an inch and a half wide. Okay, that clock is slow. That's okay. Good morning. Glad to, glad to see everyone here. Um, glad to have Kasten back from school. We're expecting some to, some to get back. All your folks got back, I guess, right? And uh, looking forward to uh, family getting together this week. I think it will be the first time in, we tried to figure out how many years it's been since the Hamrick side of the family has been together for Thanksgiving at one time. It's been a while. <laughs> Laura is, uh, Laura, Karen and Laura are going to bring mom and dad down tomorrow. I'm going to drive them down tomorrow and then I'll drive them back on the, on the weekend. But uh, it'd be so uh, nice to have most of us together like we used to. <laughs> It has been a long time. It's just uh, it's uh, just been everybody's work schedules and one thing and another that uh, you've just made it uh, made it difficult. Well, let's uh, let's pray before we get started. God, we thank you for your blessings to us every day, and we thank you for the uh, time that is uh, set aside this week in our country to give thanks. We. No, we should do that a whole lot more than we do. And we pray that people really will stop and think about just how blessed they are. And that they'll think about who it comes from. Father, we thank you for the changing of the seasons. We know that these processes were started by you so long ago and that they will continue with us or without us, that you know the times that they are in your hand. Father, please forgive our sins. Please help us to be humble before you. Please help us to look to you as our salvation and not lean on our own selves. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm getting into the next big section of this study, which I have no idea if I keep going. If we keep going on this, I don't know really when it's going to wind up. May probably take a break for a while after, after this next section and come back to it later on. I still think I will be ahead of Avon Malone teaching the book of Acts, <laughs> which he taught in real time. Mm -hmm. like in real time with the events that take place in Acts. Uh, wonderful teacher, such a wonderful teacher. And he'd, we got to, got to take uh, courses with him in, at Oklahoma Christian when he was up there before he moved down here. And he'd say about halfway through the semester, well, I've got to put Paul on a jet plane instead of a boat to get him through the rest of this. But he never did. <laughs> but it was good. It was all wonderful and good. And, he was someone that made you, it made you, uh, you saw how much he loved scripture and it made you want to study it more. That um, I think the best compliment I could ever give a teacher was the first time I was asked to teach an adult class, I wanted to teach on Timothy and Titus. That was the last class I had with Avon Malone. <laughs> and you know that, he made you interested and excited about the text. Well. Uh, looking at this next, looking at this next part, I realize that to, to some extent, to start with, trying to line up three different gospel accounts which have their differences, they don't all just follow chronologically with a, with a date uh, on everything. I think maybe that may have been Bishop Usher way back there who had put dates on all the events in the Bible according to his calculation. And, Somebody, you know, doing that might have that, well, this was on the third, 13th of uh, September at about 5 o'clock in the evening, Jesus got in the boat. And, no, it's, <laughs> the Gospels don't, don't do that. We've talked about that earlier on, that 
They didn't follow chronological order the way that we would tend to. I'm looking at someone's, at an autobiography right now of uh, Iris Stanfield wrote the song, Follow Me and some other, uh, other gospel songs, trying to find some mention of why he wrote one of his songs. He keeps jumping around so much <laughs> in his autobiography that I, I, I just don't know if I'm going to catch it. Well, the Gospels are like that. They're, they're trying to convince you who Jesus is. They're trying to tell you who Jesus is, not give you a, a, not give you a, a, a timeline to follow of his life. So kind of have to make some choices. For example, the feeding of the 5,000 is a little bit later in this sequence of events, but I'm kind of putting it in together with the other big miraculous events that are around the same time. Uh, the rejection at Nazareth, one of the Gospels puts that really, really early. And we just don't know if, if uh, when you have t the Gospels describing what seems like the same thing, number one, you have to figure out, is it actually the same thing they're describing? Like the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew and the Sermon by the Sea in Luke, is that, two di is that the same sermon with just different kind of selected parts of it? Or is that two different sermons and Jesus used the same material in a lot of them, said the same things? <laughs> like Avon Malone <laughs> would have his sayings that he would use and points that he would come back to. Uh, so I feel a little, a little artificial in a way to try to, to uh, force some of these things together, but it maybe helps to look at them together, and this is, is roughly following the order of things in Mark and Luke at this point, with a few minor exceptions. So what's happened up to this point, so we've just come through a period of time where the Pharisees are really starting to oppose Jesus, and they latched on to the Sabbath rules in particular. That was the thing, that was something they were focused on anyway. Was, was everybody following the rules and everybody keeping the rules the way they said they were supposed to keep the rules. And so that was an easy thing to, to pick at Jesus about. At least they thought it was. So he started to get some opposition, but people are talking about him even more. What we see in this period is you've got even more miracles. Up to this point, he's... What kinds of miracles has he done up to this point? You got changing water to wine. That's pretty. That's, I mean, that's that's amazing. It's not real spectacular in a sense because unless you were standing there watching, you know, looking in the thing, then the servants are the ones who knew what happened. And as word spread, people knew what happened. But if you heard someone telling you about it, you think. Well, really? <laughs> it's not like a bunch of people saw it at one time. Casting out demons is pretty amazing, a pretty amazing thing, and it certainly would be convincing to the person who had the demon. <laughs> It'd be very convincing to their family. Other people, hmm, you know, it's, they, they, they would be impressed, but then... Um, uh, healing diseases, of course, healing leprosy, very dramatic thing. But some of those miracles, we don't really know that there were a lot of witnesses to them either, like the man with leprosy at Capernaum that came to Jesus. Don't really know how many people were around when that happened. These miracles were pretty huge. Calming the storm, you either did that or you did not do that. There is no debating over what happened at that point. It was, and there were other witnesses besides the disciples. Interesting that Mark says there were other ships, there were other boats out there at the same time. So there would have been other people who could have seen it. The Legion of Demons. This was a guy everybody in that area knew, and they knew to stay away from him. They had dealt with this, they dealt with this guy before, or guys, Got to get to that and figure that out. There's sounds like there's more than one person out there that Jesus deals with the main one, but um, 
And that legion is pretty terrifying. I mean, that sounds like something out of a horror movie, right? <laughs> it says, we are called legion for we are many. You can imagine the voice from that, you know. It's like some, some scary movie. Um, what's that? Yeah, uh, this was someone everybody in that area knew what was going on. And then the thing with the pigs, that was, that was a huge thing. And then we come to the raising the dead. Even though Jesus chose not to do that in a real public way any more than he had to with people gathered around the house. And feeding the 5,000. Well, that's at least 5,000 people knew something really amazing had happened there. So there's a lot, there's a group of really spectacular miracles here. And then we start to come to a point where people are having to decide, what do I think about this man? What am I going to do? He's rejected at Nazareth. There is, during this period, Herod executes John the Baptist. And Jesus, during this period, for the first time, talks about going to Jerusalem and laying down his life and the sacrifice that would have to be made to follow him. When he says, if anyone will follow me, let him take up his cross. Imagine being the first, there the first time he said that and hearing him, take up my cross? What? <laughs> That's, we've, we've gotten familiar with that term, with that, you know, with that concept. I, I don't mean that we don't respect or reverence it, but we've heard that concept. A person hearing it the first time, that was, that was something you didn't, you didn't really want to think about even, much less picture yourself doing. And the confession of Peter, a kind of a climactic part of this section, when Jesus is asking the disciples, okay, who's everybody, what are people saying about me? And there's all these different things. You know, Herod thought that he was John the Baptist come back from the dead. Some people were saying he was Elijah or one of the other prophets. And then, of course, Peter says, Jesus asks them the real question, who do you say that I am? And that's is that what, yeah, that's what I ended up saying about this whole section of the Gospels. The question is, who do you say that he is? And Peter, of course, gives that answer, the Christ, the Son of God. And then the transfiguration gives Peter, James, and John that view of Jesus as he really is, in a sense gives them that view of Jesus that confirms visually what they had already accepted, what they had already accepted spiritually. Yet at the same time, you see the disciples really struggling in this period. It's gotten harder during this time. It's not just following, it wasn't necessarily easy the, <laughs> earlier, they had to give up things, they had to walk away from their work they had to face the, probably questions from their families. But now they're really struggling to see what their part is in this. Right after the Transfiguration, it's so, you couldn't write a story better than this. Right after the Transfiguration, they come down from the mountain and the other disciples are trying to cast out a demon and failing, and failing. And that's part of the story too. So some, and uh, of course behind all of this is Jesus gradually starting to reveal what the, what the outcome of all this will be, that, uh, that he is going to go to Jerusalem, that there's going to be, that he's going to lay down his life, and also that there's a judgment coming on the nation for rejecting him too. It's kind of an undercurrent of this as well. And the disciples, remember what, what did Peter say the first time Jesus gave them that straight out, that I'm going to go up to Jerusalem and be sacrificed? Peter's like, no, no, this can't, you've got to be wrong about that. They, they were struggling to understand this. Well, the very first one of these, calming the storm, he got in the boat Mark says on that day when evening had come, so we know that it's in the evening time. <clears throat> if we follow Mark's order, 
and uh, Luke as well. It's after the day of teaching all the parables, parable of the sower and the mustard seed and uh, several others. So Jesus has been teaching all day. That day evening had come, he said, let's go across to the other side. They're on the west bank of, uh, on the west shore of Galilee, going to go across the east to the east side. Leaving the crowd, they took him, Mark says, in the boat just as he was. They didn't take time to get supplies or anything. Uh, I hate taking off on a trip like that, don't you? Don't have time to go to the store or anything. They just, he wanted to get out of there. <laughs> There's probably good reason for that. And Mark says there were other boats with them. The disciples, the disciples followed him. Behold, there arose a great storm on the sea. Mark says, uh, and Luke say, a great windstorm. Luke says, the windstorm came down on the lake. Some foolish skeptic tried to say that Mark and Luke contradict each other because Mark says a storm arose and Luke says a storm came down. But if you've ever been in the middle of a storm like that, you know it's going up and down at the same time, practically. <laughs> Besides, it's just the way people speak. My grandmother would say that it was going to come up a storm. Well, the storm actually comes from the sky down, but that's just the way we, we speak about things. The boat's being swamped by the waves. Mark tells us the uh, waves are breaking into the boat, and the boat is, is filling. I believe the King James Version says in one of, one of these, King James Version says the boat was filled, uh, it's kind of a miss on the translation there a little bit. It was in the process of filling. It wasn't completely full, or they would have been under the water already. And they were filling with water, and Luke says they were in danger. And they wake up Jesus, and look at what they say in each of the <laughs> different accounts. It records different words in each one. <laughs> And Jesus says to them, why are you afraid, you of little faith? He arose and rebuked the winds. Matthew tells us that he said this to them before he rebuked the winds. Mark and Luke just tell us that he rebuked the winds, and then he says something like that afterwards. May have said it both times. In an event like this, people are probably saying a lot of things all at the same time, aren't they? <laughs> You've been in a... In a situation like that, there's probably a lot of things being said. And he says, you have little faith? Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? In Luke, where is your faith? And then at the end here, they marveled, saying, what sort of man is this? They're filled with fear. Even the winds and the sea obey him. Well, just a little background on, on this. That is the famous boat that uh, you know, sometimes here called the Jesus boat. That's kind of a silly thing because there's no connection particularly to Jesus. But this was found back in, the I think, the 1990s when Galilee, the water level got really low during a drought and they saw something kind of sticking up there. Sure enough, this is a first century boat that has been uh, brought out and put on display in Israel. And you can kind of get a perspective on the size of it from the rail there next to it. We don't know what size boat Jesus and the disciples were in. It'd be kind of, look like it'd be kind of tough for 12 men to fit in that boat. Of course, if there were other boats, we don't know they were all in the same boat. Not to, well, they were all in the same boat in a metaphorical sense, but... They might have been in one of the other ships, or it might have been a little bit larger version of something like that. But you can see it's kind of shallow. Uh, it doesn't, have a, doesn't really have a keel to it. It's kind of a shallow, flat-bottomed boat. It makes sense if you're, working along, if you're working along the shore, if you're fishing close to the shore. A lot of Galilee's pretty shallow. And it's kind of, kind of the shape of a, of a big lifeboat like you'd have on a on a larger ship. This is from the 1920s at Tiberias, and you can sort of see from the people in the boats that that's about the same kind of thing, 
more or less, not a lot of change there. A uh, real simple, real simple mast and sail that they can put up and take down depending on what they need to do. There's one off to the top left corner, you can see one boat pulled out to the side there that kind of shows the um, cross pieces in it that would be braces. <clears throat> Give it a little more strength and also a place to sit. The boat that Jesus and the disciples are in is probably a little bigger than that. Yes, Leah, I had to go with the topographical map. I, did, I, I was not going to do it, but it won't take just a minute. If I had done anything else in my education, I would have been a meteorologist. This is just fascinating. Of course, I'm from Oklahoma. We have a special relationship with the weather. But when you live in a place, you kind of understand, if you've grown up in a place especially, you kind of understand what the weather's like. You know how your geography affects you. We have the Rocky Mountains up to the north of us, northwest, and that causes the cold air comes barreling down the plains on the east side of the Rocky Mountains. Then we've got the Gulf down south of us. Can you tell when the air is coming up from the south with that rain on it? <laughs> you smell that rain in the air. I remember saying that to my kids when they were little, and they said, how can you smell rain? I said, well, you just take a whiff and then remember the next time it's, <laughs> that's what it is. And what we have here with Galilee is uh, right up at the top of the slide is Mount Hermon. That's the highest point in the nation of Israel today, I think. There may be another peak up there that's a little higher, but that's, that's you know, up in the highest points. And then you have the Jordan Valley coming down. So you know cold air is going to be up there in the mountains to the north. You have the sea on this side, and the weather from the sea comes in, but the land rises towards the, before it gets to the Jordan Valley, the land rises. Yeah, I need the little laser pointer thing here. And can you see how these valleys are cut going from left to right, from the sea going into Galilee? There are these ravines that are cut by creeks and rivers. So the wind from the sea carrying moisture can settle into those ravines and come at a pretty high speed down into this valley. Then off to the eastern side here, what do you have? Desert. <laughs> You're getting out into the, uh, getting out into the, into the desert on the east. So you got hot air out there. Galilee itself is seven, about 700 feet below sea level. So you're going from a few thousand feet in the mountains around it, cold air coming down, moist air coming in, hot air coming in, and it all comes down into that lake. And this is what can happen. The man in his notes on that video said that this was in the morning, and he looked out, and this wind started blowing, and just within a minute or two, you start seeing those waves come up like that. I don't know that much about boats. I'm not an expert kayaker like Kevin. I've never even been out, I've never even been out in a kayak. I wouldn't go out, I, I know at least when you see the little white parts on the waves out like that, don't go out there in a little rowboat. You don't want to be out there in that stuff. And the disciples wouldn't have wanted to be out there either, but because you're down at such a low level, you can't see the stuff coming. That's the great thing about West Texas, right? <laughs> I've heard the story of the uh, first time that Carl went to visit Doris's family out in West Texas, and there was a little bitty cloud off in the distance. Doris said, we'll be in the cellar tonight. <laughs> sure enough, there was a tornado. <laughs> but you can see it coming way off out there. In Galilee, it's just on you suddenly. And it, it reminds me, actually the description of the, the weather and the topography there reminds me of that terrible tragedy earlier this year, I think, in Branson, where the, uh, the duck um, amphibious vehicle was swamped out uh, on the lake outside of Branson. Same kind of thing. It's an artificial lake down in a, in a valley there in the, in the hills, and the weather can just come up terribly suddenly in that situation and I've been on that I've been on that ride I've been on that thing and yeah you would be out of luck if you're out on that lake when a storm came up it's, it's just 
can't move fast enough to get out of the way. And the disciples out there on Galilee, all they can do, get on those oars and start rowing, you know. Because <laughs> if you put the sail up, the wind's going to catch that thing and turn you over. So you just turn it into the, I guess you just turn it into the waves and you start rowing and praying. So the trip itself, they're heading over to the eastern shore. There's never been as much settlement on the east side of Galilee. Um, just hasn't developed that way. Uh, still kind of sparsely populated. Probably Jesus wants to get away for a little while, let the opposition cool off. Also, let the people that he's just been preaching to think about those parables a little bit. Let it sink in a little bit. And he needs to take time also with his disciples to teach them lessons privately. In fact, this turns out to be what he's doing here, but it's a, it's a strange sort of school Jesus ran sometimes. <laughs> this was a, a lesson that had to be learned in an odd way. With the storm, Luke describes this as a, as a windstorm. Matthew actually uses the Greek word seismos, said it was an earthquake. Well, there is actually a fault line on the Jordan Valley, that's why it is like that. I guess it's possible there was an earthquake along with the storm, I don't know. I think it's more likely figurative language. You know, Matthew was there, <laughs> okay? Unlike Mark and Luke, Matthew was actually there. And he said it was like an earthquake. It was bad. And the boat is covering up with waves, coming up over the gunwales. I know enough about boats, I know that part. It's coming up over the side. Of course, those boats for fishing, they'd want to have it low enough that they could reach out and handle their nets and all that. But it's starting to come over the side. But Jesus is asleep. You can't help but point out that Jonah was asleep during a storm, too. Of course, Jonah was running away from God, and his being able to sleep through the storm didn't, didn't say much about him. Jesus, of course, knew he was safe in his Father's hands, and he could sleep the, the sleep of the innocent. But funny parallels with Jesus and Jonah here and there. He was tired. He'd have to be pretty tired to sleep through all that. I mean, I know people that probably our son could probably sleep through that. But he was tired. Hebrews chapter 4, 15 tells us we have a, a high priest who, who knows how we are, who shares that, that humanity with us. Jesus knows what it's like to be completely worn out. And it wasn't weakness on Jesus' part. Uh, one commentator pointed out this isn't weakness on his part. This is, this is strength of character on Jesus' part. He ran himself right up to the limit. And then he had to stop. He had to take off and get his, uh, get his rest, get his strength back. We have to do that too sometimes. But that's, that's him learning all about. Yeah. Yeah. He experienced all of it. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. So, he knew what that was like. That's mm -hmm. the greatness of him being our advocate. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Job cried for that, right? Job asked for someone mm -hmm. to go on his behalf. We have that, and he's gone through everything. Yeah. So thank you. It's a good point. The spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. When he said that, he knew firsthand how true that was. It also, in this situation, seems like Jesus isn't worried about it. Like he isn't worried about the danger that they're in. One commentator pointed out it's kind of like with when he hears that Lazarus is sick. It seems like he's not concerned larger point there, there seem like times you wonder, and certainly in the Psalms you see statements like that all the time, Lord, how long? Lord, don't you realize, <laughs> don't you realize what I'm going through? 
Sometimes it seems like God doesn't know what's going on. He does. He just hasn't done it, hasn't taken care of it yet. And they cry out. They have all these different things, and uh, uh, each one of them recorded by a different gospel writer. I imagine probably all of them yelling, them at one, yelling these things at once, and maybe other things besides that. And especially that what Mark records, do you not care that we are perishing? Well, they realize they need Jesus. Up to a certain point, you know, as the weather starts getting a little bad, you can imagine this conversation's going on. You've got Peter and Andrew and James and John, at least, maybe some others. These were men who grew up on that lake. Their families were in, the James and John's family were, were in the fishing business. They'd been out there before. They knew what it was like. And up to a certain point, you can imagine them looking around and saying, well, no, I don't like the look of it. But, okay, we'll, we better get into those oars and try to get across. We need to try to hurry up. Up to a certain point, they're relying on their human ability, what they already, what they know. And they wouldn't think to ask Jesus. He's not, he grew up in Nazareth. He's not a, he's not a, a you know, a sailor like them. When it got out of control, then they were ready to wake up Jesus. Does that ring a bell with any, I don't know. <laughs> Does that ring a bell on anybody in their lives? They did seem to believe that Jesus could do something about it. I don't think they were just saying, hey, you want to wake up before we all die here, just so you'll know what's going on <laughs> when we all drown. Uh, they seemed to think he could do something. Did, uh, so they're... She's driving through the fire in California. Mm -hmm. And she it starts off that they everyone's in the car and they're driving. And then when the plane when she arrives into the planes, and there are planes so red hot on the left and so red hot on the right, and she's driving and she's at that point she's going, please God, please God, please get us out of this, please God, please. It was, yeah, I mean, the, the, her voice, the, and when I was watching that, I thought to myself, she's calling to God for help, mm -hmm. which we all do. Mm -hmm. But during the time where she's not near the fire, does she go to God at any time? Yeah. We all turn to God when the water's coming. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we get we get notification of cancer. We mm -hmm. uh, a, a bad storm's coming. Uh, you know, you're driving through a firestorm. You know? Yeah. Uh, we turn to him at that, mm -hmm. at that point. But it was it was a, a really awakening fear in that woman's voice mm -hmm. that on this planet she was. Completely, completely at the mercy of what was happening. She was crying out. Yeah. Well, they had seen Jesus do a lot of things. They had never seen him do anything like he was getting ready to do. <laughs> They'd never seen anything like that. They seemed to make some assumptions. They, they assume that Jesus is in the same danger that they think they're all in, that he's in danger of drowning. They seem to assume that he either doesn't know or doesn't care, that he needs to get, he needs to get woken up and, and be alert to what's going on. And they cry for help, probably uh, a lot of things being said at once. Some have suggested that, as tradition tells us at least, that Mark was traveling with Peter late in his life and that Mark in his gospel account may have been led to record a lot of Peter's own descriptions of things. You can imagine Peter telling this story over and over again throughout his life, especially Peter, a fisherman. <laughs> the impression this would have made on him. And some have suggested that that may have been Peter's own word there, do you not care that we're perishing? <laughs> Do you even care? And then the response of Jesus. 
power of his words. He upholds the world by the, by the word of his power. Amazing thing here, it says that the waves were calmed. How long does it take? How long does it take? So I've never been out on the water that much. All I like to think about is like the bathtub. So when you're a little kid and you're in the bathtub and you're sloshing the water back and forth, trying to see how high you can get it sloshed before it goes out on the floor and you get in trouble. Once you stop, how long does it take the, how long does it take the waves to stop? It takes a minute, right? Because the water has mass and it, the water has, the water has a lot of weight to it when you get a bunch of it together. On, if you've got enough force going through that water to cause those white caps, that's a lot of energy there. It's not just going to dissipate suddenly, but here it does. Now, the storm suddenly stopping, well, we live in Texas. We've seen strange things before. I've seen it start raining, leave the house dry, and it starts raining, and then stops before we get down here to the church building, and it's dry here. So you can imagine that. The waves don't just stop moving like that. That's an incredible display of power over nature. And he rebukes his disciples. One thing he says, why are you so afraid? Fear is a natural thing, right? I look at those, at those waves tossing up and down, and that makes me, I'm not afraid because I know that was a video taken several years ago, and I'm not in any danger from it. But if I imagine myself out in a boat on that stuff, whew. <laughs> now, you, your good sense starts to kick in there that this is not, this is not something I want to be in. Uh, a certain amount of fear is a normal thing. It keeps you from doing foolish things, hopefully. <laughs> it keeps you from doing foolish things. Not always. But it's also something that has to be overcome at times, right? Interesting point here, I think, is R.C. Trench in his notes on the parables said that Jesus shows here that the enemy of faith is not necessarily unbelief, but fear is the greatest enemy of faith. It's not so much that we don't believe, but that we're afraid to act on belief. There's maybe some, maybe some truth to that, maybe some legitimacy to that. And he asks, where is your faith? You know, they have some. He says, you have little faith. He didn't say you have no faith. They have some. Little faith maybe means it just didn't last long. It might be duration rather than volume or amount. <laughs> you know, the, they had some faith, but it gave out. And that happens to us sometimes. They needed, and you know, the, the question that comes to my mind is, what did, they, what did Jesus expect them to do? What did Jesus want them to do ideally? To just keep on going, just keep on plugging in the storm, trusting that, well, Jesus is here, it's going to be okay. I guess that's what he wanted them to do. He wanted them to trust him without a miracle. Dean, go ahead. That's a good point, because he never promised that you're not going to drown in the Lake of Galilee. He never gave him any promise that you're not going to drown out here in this, in this lake. And that is a good point for us looking at a lot of things, you know, in a broader perspective, because we don't... I, I'm thinking about, as, as Kevin mentioned, the woman driving through the fire. I haven't had a situation that dramatic. I did, I did find myself looking down the on-ramp to Interstate 20 from a, a fairly high flyover coming down into Interstate 20 and realized that whole thing was covered with ice all the way down. 
and there was no way to back up. <laughs> I just had to go down. And I uh, said, Lord, please uh, help me get down this in one piece. And otherwise, I hope I'll be seeing you soon. <laughs> so, along that line, you know, that I know it would be okay. But I, uh, yeah, we, uh, we, we, we have to realize that we have to realize that sometimes the deliverance, let me start that over again. We aren't guaranteed that nothing bad's going to happen to us. That's definitely true from this. They got in the middle of a terribly bad storm and they were horribly frightened. Like I've heard about, is that the kayaking <laughs> incident? <laughs> yeah. So, storms are very fearful. Oh, yeah. You realize that Dean mentions that the technology makes us less afraid of things. There's no kind of technology that's going to save you out there in that kayak. <laughs> there, and no matter what we build, there's always something going to overcome it. You look at all we've got today. A half an inch of ice can shut this town down, can't it? <laughs> you know? We can't. We can't do anything about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know, as Peter says, uh, it's, it's first Peter, oh, rats can't remember, it didn't have this written down. Either first or second Peter, just, you know, read the whole thing, I guess. When he says that uh, don't be surprised <laughs> that these things are happening to you. Don't act like some strange thing's happening to you that you're having persecution and trials. Yes, sir. I just, I just don't know that we can, I don't know that we can know. One thing we can see about what the devil said about, what the devil said about Job, well, we know the devil's a liar anyway, but in that case, he was also, if that's what he really thought, the devil was wrong. 
Job wasn't just following God because God had been good to him. And it, it had to be proved through that. Well, just to, to wrap this up, <laughs> a funny thing, funny thing about the story, in a, in a, I guess in an ironic way, is they were really scared while the storm was going on. After Jesus stopped it, then they were really afraid. Uh, kind of slow learners, and I'm not, I'm saying we all are slow learners. We all are slow learners. They see his holiness against their unworthiness. Think about Peter after he, after that miraculous catch of fish, and he says, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. He recognized, and we've got to be afraid of the right things. This touches on something Dean said, Luke 12, 5, uh, when Jesus says, don't fear those who can kill the body. And fear the one who can cast into hell. And they ask again, who is this man? And that kind of sets us up for this whole, for this whole section. You know, there were various people asking, who is this man? And then finally Jesus asks his disciples that. And that's the great question for all of us. Well, thank you very much and thank you for your comments.